Lever's War Room for July 2015. And today, my partner Raj and I, my name is Praveen, we're going to be covering the China slowdown or trouble in China and the potential for a slowdown. And today we're going to, for those of you who have, who have been with us on the War Room in the past, we're going to change up the format a little bit. We're going to jump right in actually and take a look at the scenarios and questions. And, uh, and then we're going to spend the, the balance of our time discussing China in more detail and understanding where our assumptions came from with respect to each potential scenario outcome for our China slowdown scenarios. Uh, for those of you who are following along on, uh, on your computers, if you're logged into your Hidden Levers account, I've logged in and I'm going to go into the scenario library. And then in the scenario library, we see that one of the trending scenarios, the top left of our screen, is the China slowdown. And we're going to jump into the China slowdown scenario details. All right, here we are in the China slowdown scenario page. And we see the three different outcomes that we're going to be taking a look at. And we have a positive case, a sort of neutral uh, to slightly negative case and then the full-blown recession case. And so let's review those cases quickly uh, with respect to a sample portfolio and see what that looks like. And then, uh, as I said, from there, we'll jump into our full presentation and talk about uh, where those assumptions come from and potential ramifications. All right, let me pull up my sample portfolio now. And for simplicity, I'll just pull up the one portfolio, although, as you guys saw, you you can, of course, and you mo most of you know, you can include more than one portfolio. Now, this is interesting. I've actually got some explosive calls in this portfolio, which I didn't realize we had put in there. That's exciting. You guys can see some options modeling as well. Well, I started out by looking at the double happiness outcome within our China scenarios, and, and that's actually the most positive of the three cases with the Shanghai Composite Index which is uh, among the new uh, levers that we've added to, to our system in the last month. So now we can track a scenario based on uh, 10 different international indices, including Shanghai. And we have here Shanghai rising up to 5,000 or into the 5,000 range. I can click on the, uh, on the lever, the name of the lever there, Shanghai, Shanghai and I can see, uh, for those of you who are following the international markets, you know, of course, that Shanghai was, had reached a near-term peak just about a month ago and then crashed super rapidly. And we'll talk more about the magnitude of that crash, but uh, it has started to recover a bit from there. So this particular scenario envisions a 25% or rise roughly on the Shanghai Composite. And what would the positive impact be on the U.S. markets? Well, roughly 7 to 8% on the S&P 500, a little bit more than that on small caps in the U.S. We're looking at uh, the Russell 2000 ETF we've plugged in here. Very nominal impact on a fixed income. As we can see, we've, we've included a fixed income ETF as well. And um, as you can see with respect to some of the other funds, uh, you know, depending on, on the fund and its sensitivity, we also have a few individual share individual equities here, Walmart and Wells Fargo, this is examples. And then finally down at the end you can see the S and P calls with not surprisingly if you have a scenario that moves the market up uh, roughly ten percent in a short in a short time frame, you're gonna see some incredible performance on a uh, position like that. All right. Now some of you may know that when you're in a particular scenario you can use the related outcomes navigation on the left to navigate to the other versions of the scenario. So we've got double happiness, that's the most positive. Shanghai crash, which is the neutral scenario, sounds very negative, but the reason that that's actually sort of the neutral scenario is that it's a crash in Shanghai, not necessarily a crash worldwide. There is a negative impact, as we can see, on U.S. equities. But if we have 25% down in Shanghai, one of the things we saw very recently was the, the capture ratio, how much that impacts uh, U.S. markets. The U.S. market capture ratio is really not so high. and so. In this case, we envision a potential impact in the 8% neighborhood. On the fixed income side, you actually see mild positive returns as a result of uh, mild drops 
in uh, treasury yields. And so, of course, as rates go down, we get that, that mild positive impact. So this is more of a market scenario from a China perspective. This is not assuming a full-blown recession in China, uh, but really that the, that the government uh, regulators there in China, all of their interventions into the stock market don't pan out for the best, and, and they lead to, uh, you know, it, it causes the Shanghai market to crumble back down to the levels that it was, it was falling toward uh, just a month ago. All right, so that takes me then to our bearish downside scenario. The downside scenario being, what if China experiences its first major recession since 1980? So that's something that uh, I don't think it's common knowledge, actually, is that China, since they started their major economic reforms, they've never really had a true recession where there's any period, uh, you know, even the sort of uh, well-accepted definition of a recession of two quarters of negative GDP growth. They've, they haven't had a spell like that in a span of now 35 years. And so we're asking that question, what does that look like? Yeah, a generation. That's really amazing if you think about that. You, you have to be literally uh, something like 50 to really know, uh, you know, and, and of course we know that, that there are a lot of young people in China, and so most uh, Chinese people do not know what a recession feels like. So, uh, so here we are projecting a 50% downside on the Shanghai Composite. Back to levels, of, uh, when I pulled up the chart before you might have seen, for a period of roughly a year, that's actually the level that the Shanghai Composite sat at during the 2014, late 2013, in that time frame. So just to crash back to those levels, and here we are um, within the scenario showing a deeper impact on the S&P as a result of the fact that uh, if the recession gets that, uh, or rather if the, the economic situation and the market situation get that negative in China, then the, the correlation between uh, the Chinese economy and markets and U.S. markets will rise, and, and you'll see that, that relative impact. So uh, on this overall portfolio, the minus 24% is likely no small part due to those calls uh, going bust. But as we can see, there are some equities, Wells Fargo here, uh, this Europe ETF, that uh, have significant impacts, not dissimilar to China, uh, and then some more defensive names like Walmart, and then, of course, a lot of the ETFs not so badly impacted. Uh, I will note the risk, of course, is small caps as well, which perhaps isn't surprising, but the downside risk is much greater on the small cap side. And we'll take a look at these uh, portfolios again a bit later. We might even put in a robo-advisor, which are, uh, you know, the, the word on the street is that they have more EM allocation than um, than one would like, so they may be more vulnerable to that. But um, let's get back to the beginning is, how did you guys come up with this scenario? You know, and that is that is what we're here to do. So Absolutely. So, yeah, we saw a little bit about what the scenario might look like, and now let's jump in and let's cover the details. So I'll open up the slides here so we can take a look at our content for today's presentation. And Roger, if you want to take us through, and, and we'll go from there. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks for being here and being part of Hidden Levers. Uh, of course, we'll start with the market update. The War Room is uh, covers uh, a lot of uh, economic scenario updates, not just uh, on China. That is the main one we'll deal with today. So the, the scenarios that we have going, uh, the rate hike, we, it's pretty obvious that uh, Janet Yellen is adamant about raising rates in 2015, despite anything happening in Europe, despite any hiccup in China. Uh, that is the story, and so we are counting on that. Uh, you can see the dollar rising off the back of that. Uh, gold and then things that happened with that. You know, one thing about um, the precious metals like gold and silver going down to their five-year lows, that's no new story, uh, but the people were conflating oil and, and gold um, uh, and the whole nuclear impact, uh, the impact of that and saying, well, okay, if Iran is coming back online, then, then, then oil prices should go back to new lows, but they actually came down from $60 to $50, so the nuclear pact is likely priced in. The kind of tick down from there in oil prices is just the same as gold, and that's the skyrocketing of the dollar due to the Janet Yellen uh, adamant um, language around a rate hike. So don't conflate all that stuff is what I'm saying. Uh, in other stuff, uh, we've been hearing a lot around t technology. We've, we've covered this scenario uh, just recently, uh, but in in the past month, it looks like the, the rally is really narrowing to a few names. We've had now a, a unicorn go bust, which is what we talked about in the tech bubble 
2.0 scenario. It was a home joy, a home cleaning on demand service, basically a, a, a housekeeper version of Uber. Uh, so that has gone bust, you know, several, uh, almost $50 million in funding and a billion dollar valuation company. Hat. So we have the, the donkey on the tail there. Um, if I go to the next part of the market update, I can see uh, real in, a, in elaborate terms, the dollar rise. Okay, here, you know, starting to get into the China story, actually, and telling the dollar story while we're at it. Um, you can see the bullish pattern being made. Uh, we had a little bit of consolidation there in the summer, but since the end of quantitative easing, as that, uh, even July before quantitative easing started in October, uh, ended in October f fully, uh, you have this immense rise of the dollar past what anybody thought. And uh, for us, that's, you know, the, the QE related rise was priced in. Now it's about the rate hike expectation. And so it looks like that march upward has continued. And if the bullish pattern holds, then that, um, you know, upwards of 20% rise that we had from July till April, that M top, that would be mirrored on this side. After the bullish consolidation, a 20% further rise, putting us well in the triple digits on the US dollar index. So one thing about this is, you know, just simple stuff that that uh, your clients may understand or may not, your prospects, a rate hike definitely means a stronger dollar. It doesn't mean people use less gas or less oil, they're driving less, it just means a super strong dollar. And so, you know, things that are based in dollars that are increasing along with that, that's an incredible thing. Let's say housing prices are still increasing and it's based in dollars, it's double doubling down. Uh, the yuan, uh, so on the subject of, of China, is pegged to the dollar. You can see that chart has not changed that much uh, because the, the yuan is increasing as the dollar is increasing. They just pegged that. The government's had that in place for a good bit. And so the, the divergence from the dollar isn't that much on the upside or downside. So in, in all we've discussed today on China, uh, just know that there is hardly any currency implication to the dollar's immense rise. Okay. Preen, anything to add to that on the dollar? Um, no, I was going to say, if you look at the blue line of the bullish pattern on the dollar, uh, because this chart is showing, you know, it's showing the value of the yuan and then the value of the dollar. And the value of the dollar there is against the basket of currencies, uh, the dollar index as it's, you know, as it's calculated. And so really a lot of that bullish pattern is due to the dollar's rise against the euro, for instance, other European currencies. Uh, a, um, some other Asian currencies, but a lot of the Latin American currencies have crashed, like Brazil. Uh, and so really that's a lot of um, what's driving that huge rise or, or what's... Why don't we show the, the currency area on the economic data center? Might be good. Yeah, just to give you guys a sense for where this data can be found. Under data center, you can always go to economic data. I'll just open it in a new tab so we don't lose our slides. Um, and within the data center, you can always go to currencies and you can find charts and historical data for, for any of these. And we can see, for instance, uh, who did I just pick on? I picked on Brazil. So we can see this is the value of the Brazil and the dollar. And we can see this crash lines up pretty much with the chart that we just looked, like, looked at with regard to the dollar's rise. Whereas if we look at a chart of the yuan, same data we were looking at on the slide, you can see that it has these long flat periods and even recently fluctuates a little bit, but it pretty much stays in the same overall range. And that's that's essentially because of that peg, that loose peg that the, the Chinese uh, government keeps. Uh, we had a question, please explain how rate hike increases the dollar value. Really what that means is that if the U.S. Uh, government increases uh, rates, then relatively speaking, you know, relative to other currencies, it is more attractive, more profitable to keep your cash holdings in dollars because you can keep them in a U.S. bank and actually get paid some positive interest finally. For We're paying involved. significantly more interest than we have been for the past decade. Yeah, I mean, it's funny, you know, of course, yeah, almost a decade now or uh, certainly like eight years, coming on eight years of 0% interest rates. So even getting 25 basis points uh, or maybe 50 basis points if your term is a little bit longer is um, it's, it's not high, but it's certainly higher than Europe, so it makes us more attractive than the Euro, that sort of thing. And so that's going to um, 
going to help drive the dollar of the value higher. And then, and then relative to gold, uh, you know, for instance, to the extent that gold is thought of as a currency, well, it's a currency that pays no interest. And so uh, it makes the dollar relatively more valuable there as well. Yeah, so the dollar is gaining, and it's just a, a sense of our own economic picture. And if interest rates are higher here, then dollars flow into the United States. There's tons of reason already for them to flow in. But as you, you know, the, the next leg up is if they actually increase rates, or expectations of that at least. Right. All right, let's move now to talking about uh, China. You know, of course, we talked about the yuan and the currencies there, but let's let's set the context for um, today's discussion about the importance. Let's start with the importance of the Chinese economy. And I think that uh, probably all of you realize that it is very important, that it is considered the number two economy in the world. Uh, interestingly, depending on how you measure, according to the IMF, we are already at the crossover point where um, on a, what's called a purchasing power uh, parity basis, uh, the uh, Chinese economy is larger, is now larger than uh, the U.S. economy. So, and what that means is that's taking uh, the uh, cost of living into account because cost of living is so much lower in China. So buying equal, equal types of goods in each country, how much if you rebase based on prices is, uh, is spending worth in China. And so on that basis, China is larger. On a nominal basis, using just uh, normal exchange rates, China is still uh, very large. We can see the, the chart here, the, the big pie chart, with the United States at 25% roughly of the world economy and China at 15%. So it's still, you know, uh, relative to any other country after the U.S., it's, it's the close, closest competitor and, and gaining fast, even in nominal terms. Uh, what's been more important is because because China has a large economy and because it's been growing so fast for years it's been contributing actually for a number of years prior to the, the GDP growth slowing down a bit there during the recession time frame uh, in, in 2009, in 2010, 2011, China was accounting for roughly half of all GDP growth. It's come down now if we look at this small pie chart in the corner here uh, as of um, this uh, current year, you know, 2014 to 2015, 2015, China is responsible for about a quarter of world GDP growth. Uh, the United States is has caught up a good bit because, you know, finally our economy is growing a bit. But China is still responsible for more of global growth than uh, the United States even. And so this is why it's important. If China experiences a, a real bona fide recession, well, what does that do to that pie chart? It takes a quarter of global growth away, just gone. And uh, with all the ramifications that that might might entail. In, in terms of our own growth being surpassed, you know, our GDP being surpassed, we shouldn't feel too bad about that. There's uh, for every one uh, for whatever, for every one American, there's four Chinese people, and so you know, there's the same amount of output, same amount of consumption, just a baseline. You know, there we are. Con we're still <laughs> if they consume just as much as us. Uh, then they should naturally uh, have a much larger GDP, right? So at this moment, even if they're equals, then we are consuming about 4x and producing 4x the average Chinese person. Right. And well, so now let's take a look. You know, if we set the context from a sort of a global GDP perspective, now let's look at uh, why the risk, why the fear around around China currently. And and it's important to keep keep in. Uh, in mind as we look at some of this, you know, that folks have been, some folks have been calling for a China bubble and a China crash for a number of years. And so, you know, we can get caught up in some of the, the uh, negative sort of um, market attitudes, attitudes the same way some perma bears are, have been calling for a market crash here and it hasn't been, has, has yet to happen. Uh, but there are some warning signs in this triple bubble. Essentially, we see that the rise in home prices on the, the first chart in blue the rise in debt to GDP ratio, and, and this central chart, the one with the jet, debt to GDP ratio, uh, it was it's actually color coded for, for simplicity. Uh, we cut it a little bit, but the light purple, this is actually private borrowing. So uh, in China, unlike in the US, the, uh, a relatively larger share of the total debt is uh, private corporate borrowing rather than government borrowing. And so that's this big growth in debt has actually been that corporations are taking on more and more financing from banks uh, or by selling bonds. But so that's, that's uh, getting up to troublesome levels for China. 
and then finally, uh, this and this has been what we saw over the course of the last, uh, you know, over the course really of the last year when it's hit this fever pitch. The stock market, the Chinese stock market, and the red line has been going up explosively, up at up over a hundred percent, you know, at this high, and still up over sixty percent if you look back to early 2014. Uh, so in th that's one aspect of it. And the, the second aspect of it is the blue line that kind of gets covered up, but that's margin financing, the explosive growth of margin borrowing, uh, a lot of that by retail investors who are uh, borrowing hand over fist in order to buy more stocks. Uh, that w That is, uh, you know, parallels very well what happened in the late 20s in the United States. And uh, and so that is, you know, the, the sort of big risk factor as far as bubbles. Credit Suisse, this is just a, a statement that we, um, we came across uh, by their global research team, that it's a combination of the third biggest credit bubble, the biggest investment bubble, and the second biggest real estate bubble of all time, make it make uh, you know the China situation currently the single biggest risk to the global economy. Right. It, it, it's, you know, and if you look at their history, they're about as far into their um, adolescence as a capitalist economy. Uh, despite what you know, whatever labels the government has, uh, they're about in their adolescence the same way in the 1920s the United States was. You know, Praveen made mention of it, but that 19, the Roaring Twenties, was the first time the United States had allowed margin, uh, margin financed equity trading, and so that's that's largely what led to uh, the bubble forming. And so it's you know even a hundred, uh, almost a hundred years later. And uh, another country is making the same mistakes. Okay. Well, so here you can see exactly what happened. I mean, a 150% rise. Uh, it kind of coincided with these, you know, with all these accounts opened, right? Just 12 million in earlier. This uh, was, was pretty much the monthly amount, and you know, a staggering 90% of of equity markets trading is retail. So on, you know, unlike here, which is probably it's probably the opposite. No. <laughs> Here, um, where it's it's dominated by institutional investing, but really um, a staggering amount. And if they're all opening accounts, and if the amount of margin is going up, and it's mostly retail accounts, then it's just dumb money. It's all dumb money. And so that's where uh, a you know a floor coming out from under it, negative 30% over the past what just a few weeks, three weeks, um, is possible. Uh, you know, not unlike any other mania, from a tulip to the 1929 crash, etc. And so, um, you know, these luckily have not affected the S&P nearly as much uh, as of yet. But as that magnitude, if that 32%, you know, if this is a, a dead cat bounce and it keeps going down to that, uh, back to the baseline, undoing all of that margin finance trading, then, then as that magnitude grows, then the impact on the U.S. would grow. What we can't expect is more volatility. You know, the only thing that's keeping that volatility at bay now is the government coming in and intervening. We'll we'll look at that more in a bit. One thing that I think is interesting looking at these charts is the uh, if you look at the top left chart of the Shanghai Composite, and you see that since really that's mid 2014, the market was up 150 percent uh, to June, so a little over that's a one year. Chart. Yeah, and then, uh, you know, so the correction that occurred, even at the bottom of that correction that occurred in June into early July, you know, it, it by no means erased the returns of the last year. So uh, really, just really amazing uh, velocity on that, on that run up. And then, of course, what you see um, from that early July, and we'll talk about it more, is government, government intervention uh, attempting to save the market and so far seems to have stabilized it for the moment. Okay, let's look for the telltale signs because you know we, one thing we we know is uh, since the financial crisis of 1998, the Asian crisis, um, you, you know the Chinese government has definitely been caught lying about their own GDP and about their own economic data. You know we have sources for that. If you if you guys re remember back that far to the late 90s, they, you know they were they were quoting numbers of seven eight handle and. The, the deflator just could 
you couldn't have gotten to that number considering um, considering other data they gave out. So they were caught really red-handed. So things don't change, you know. Um, and so we're we're fully confident that that the the Chinese government is uh, could easily be lying about their uh, staying above seven percent. So then, that being said, what are good barometers for looking at where the Chinese economy really is, without you know forcing their the, their hand to tell the truth, etc., and all that? We can just look at real things and just point to that as the as the as the key levers, as we call them. So one uh, that we've been looking at since the, uh, the beginning on hidden levers is copper. You know, it's an industrial metal and you need it to build basically anything, a bridge, a house, etc. And so if there's building and infrastructure per, uh, things going on in China, then copper will tell that story. And so you can see here, it still tracks it quite well. We will be changing that today um, because we're introducing Shanghai Composite as a proper lever. I'm excited to do that, but copper is a great tell uh, on the everyday. You can see it tick by tick as opposed to um, the Shanghai stock market, which may not be as uh, available to you. Here's easy copper close prices um, and uh, cut against the China GDP. You can see it perfectly tracks it since 2011. Uh, above that, on the top left, you can see Australian dollar. We looked at that as well. You know, the, the, the two markets we thought probably Australia and maybe Singapore. Super developed. Uh, Hong Kong, of course, is part of China now, so it could be a lot of cooking of the books or all kinds of things going on there. But, but Australia and Singapore are definitely independent completely and a front row seat, we'd think, to China uh, and their econ economic um, partnerships. Um, so we know just this past week uh, the, there was a free trade agreement between Australia and China, and so, but you can see there the Aussie dollar perfectly tracking China lower, just like copper. Uh, the Singapore wasn't so affected, so we um, that that was a uh, that one didn't work out so well. Um, so, but these these two, the Aussie dollar and copper, to us are great telltales. Uh, one thing you notice, uh, Praveen, maybe you could talk about this is is how the Shanghai market cycle is kind of out of step with the GDP cycle, the economic cycle. Usually, um, usually the stock market is about 18 months in front of where the economic cycle is going. And so, you know, the, just kind of things get priced in, but it's about 12 to 18 months looking forward. The same way that we're pricing in to the, to the dollar and rates right now, a rate hike, maybe in September, maybe in December, uh, that's, that's the stock market kind of gauging where the economy is going to be six months, 12 months, 18 months from now. So that market dynamic and uh, with the economic cycles is usually the case in the G20 countries uh, between the stock market and their economy. Completely breaks down with the Shanghai market. You can see that there on the graph. It isn't some lagged kind of echo in the economy. It is just, it's neither here nor there. Um, Praveen, do, right. is there anything you want yeah. to say about that? Well, if we look more closely at this chart, I, well, one thing I think is interesting is that uh, if we look prior to this explosive run-up that's happened uh, since mid-2014, really, uh, we can see that, you know, of course, the GDP numbers are much less frequent, but we can see that as GDP seemed like it might be picking up here, we see that the, uh, the market was following that, similarly following it down when that turned out to be sort of a head fake, and, and then again up, again up on the market, again down and down. So for a good period of time in the, within the last five years even, there did seem to be a correlation. And then something changed. Something changed, and despite the continued drop in uh, economic growth in China, instead the Shanghai uh, market just started powering upward. And uh, <laughs> all of a sudden it didn't matter anymore. So, you know, that's one Maybe of the Maybe it was the same um, moment that they allowed margin trading to take place. Yeah, so here we're, here we're looking at, you know, the wild ride is in starting from November. Uh, you know, it goes back a little further than that if we go back to that, the history of the, of the run-up. But actually, this covers, well, if we go back for a moment, so this is from 2400. If I jump back a slide, the base was here at 2000, but this is really covering from right about here. So not far off from the start of the wild rally. And so this is a nice chart put together uh, by Bloomberg, which shows, well, rate cuts, for one of the tools that uh, the Chinese regulators 
uh, put put in place to to help, um, or rather that that's the central bank really that put in place to to drive things. And then banking rules being eased, so basically allowing banks to use more leverage in their lending. Uh, you, you know, as we continue to go up the slide, we see bank rules eased again, bank rules eased again, more rate cuts, uh, unveiling plans to exchange, uh, you know, to make the bond market more free and open for governments, more bank rule cuts, or easing, easing more rate cuts, all the way up to the peak, just over 5,000, the current, you know, in this current rally. And then what's interesting is that at the peak there, this is one of the stories that, that you guys, you know, those of you who, who follow uh, emerging markets, follow China, you may have recalled that there was this hype that China, China so, so the China A shares, meaning the Shanghai Stock Exchange, historically had not been open to foreign investors. So another thing that did change uh, around the time when this rally started was that all of a sudden foreign investors were allowed to buy Chinese stock directly, or at least through ETFs and funds. It, previous to this, you had, had, you had to buy uh, funds or individual stocks on the Hong Kong exchange, the Hang Seng. So this was the first time that all the foreign investors were getting access directly to China A shares. And there was this, uh, this hype as the market was getting up to its frothy top there that MSCI was going to redefine its indices to include China A shares as part of the indices. And uh, now it's true that if you look at China's share of the world economy, being uh, a quarter of economic growth and 15% of GDP in nominal terms, that you know all things being equal, that okay, if China is 15% of world GDP, maybe China should China's shares, China's uh, equities should occupy 15% of a you know balanced world allocation, right? But, but today, if you look at almost any U.S. Uh, investment portfolio, certainly even many world allocation funds or, for, or you know, uh, funds along those lines, global allocation funds, they're not necessarily exposed at that level of China. Certainly some of them will be, but many of them are not. So this idea that, oh, if MSCI includes them, that that's going to cause a lot of buying demand uh, was, 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 a, was a hot concept. And then, of course, it didn't happen. And then shortly thereafter, all of a sudden, boom, the stock market starts crashing. And then we see the government start to intervene. I mean, they've already pumped, helped pump the market with tons of rounds of rate cuts, uh, central bank actions, and then other Their actions. own stimulus, far, yeah, far exceeding what uh, the United States did in 2008, 2009. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, in relative terms, the amount of stimulus. No short and, selling. Uh, and easing that they've done is, is, exceeds, uh, relative to the size of their economy, significantly exceeds what the Fed and what the U.S. government had done. So, but, but recently we got into some really wacky stuff, which was, uh, just before the bottom, uh, at one point, it was either 30 or, in the neighborhood of 30 or 40 percent of all names on the Shanghai Stock Exchange were actually suspended for trading. So they were just suspending them, and, and then what they did a after the suspension was release a whole new round of, um, of interventions, and, uh, and then they started letting shares begin to trade again. So, um, so definitely a, a huge degree of intervention, and, uh, and that's, that's China's attempt to, to keep their market floating high. And they, and they, of course, they, as we know, the history of these sorts of interventions is not, has not been pretty overall. So. Well, it hasn't. I mean, for whatever um, ills might have been cured by our stimulus here, um, uh, you know, you can disagree or agree, but we can all see as data that there was, we, we trended down even after that stimulus was put in place into March 2009. It's long-term effect. You know, uh, you you can't you can't really debate that it's gone pretty well, but but it didn't stop a crash. It didn't stop us losing, uh, you know, going down to the mid sixes on the S and P, and so all these interventions right. uh, really might just be pre preventing the in inevitable. Uh, you know, some of the more important ones that uh, we'll definitely update this chart uh, after this uh, after the war room. Is including you know when they've they've suspended margin trading now, you know duh, and, and then also refuse short selling. So just some things that are you know have that same bad smell as the U.S. Uh, interventions into the market in the in 2008 crisis, and then things that even smell worse, frankly, you know just 40% uh, yeah, of the market just you, in the offline. Yeah, exactly. It was something like 1,800. Individual names on you know out of out of something like four thousand were suspended. So really, <laughs> the biggest um, market in the world. <laughs> yeah, really pretty crazy. 
Yeah, and so right now, actually, the, the, the way that the, the volatility has been decreased in the Chinese markets is, is just the government every single day being vigilant. And so really not a free market. It's, it's communist-controlled stock market. That's about it. Right. Well, so here's an interesting, um, uh, you know, a question that I think that, that many of you would ask, you know, being, it, it, you know if, if you have an interest in this topic and you, and you want to know, uh, on behalf of your clients, well, what is the potential impact of a uh, downturn in China on the world, and of course, by extension, you know, on the UN United States, on our markets, and then on our economy? Uh, what we see here first in, in the top left is this impact by geography, and notably absent, actually, is North America, North America and South America on this map. Part of the reason for that is that the impacts are felt, actually, in some of these countries that are closer that are commodities producers. Africa, interestingly, is most impacted uh, because a lot of the, the countries that you see in orange or red there produce a lot of commodities that are sold directly into the Chinese market. Uh, and then you have the oil producers in the Middle East, like Saudi Arabia, that they would be impacted by uh, slack in commodities demand. Uh, Europe, a bit less so. Germany is somewhat impacted just because they uh, are a huge export nation. But if we look uh, at the bottom right now, this idea of the impact of a China slowdown. So there was a, some research done by uh, the OECD, and uh, they were studying what would the impact be of a decrease in GDP growth in China in that one uh, slightly exceeding 1%. And so it lists out for each country, uh, for each region, what that would do. And you see Japan is more heavily impacted, Russia. The United States is kind of in the middle in terms of, of this chart, where that 1% one, that 1 or slightly more than 1% drop on China's GDP and, and, and growth uh, impacts the United States a little bit more than a quarter of a percent. So about one-fourth capture ratio, not huge. You know, it, it's meaningful. It's, it's much it's, less it's than the huge. BRICS even. Yeah, exactly. And so, so it's something that's, that's manageable. And uh, and significantly less than the world average. If you see the world is up there more like 0. 0.5. So well, we've uh, said it before, you know, during the the the, uh, the Grexit webinar last last month, uh, the United States GDP is 75 percent domestic. So with all right. our diversity and everything, uh, in terms of production and consumption, it's still uh, it's still very much uh, so it's somewhat insular, even after everything. Right. Exactly. Still, still reasonably insulated, and so there would be a negative impact. Uh, one of the things that we use this data to inform, though, is what what is you know the capture ratio, what might it look like as it pertains to markets, uh, you know, beyond even even just GDP. All right, well, let's talk now about the scenarios in more detail. At, at the um, start of our webinar, we looked briefly at the actual scenarios and how they might impact uh, a sample portfolio. And how to run that. Uh, but let's talk about uh, both the previous versions of the scenarios and then the new ones that we introduced today. So, Raj, if you want to take us through that. Sure. Well, you know, we've had China slow down on our radar for about three years, and probably once a year we revisit it in, um, in excruciating detail. And so that's today. Uh, since the last time we covered this, uh, probably at the beginning of last summer. And you know the, the word hard landing versus soft landing. That's kind of out of the vernacular. The image you can see there in the middle was a you know Chinese uh, some sort of track star falling off a hurdle. We don't even use that word hard landing in the vernacular. The seven percent was priced in at that time. So since then the troubles are uh, to us because we are headed toward a hard landing. You know a. 5% pronouncement. And you can see from the previous slide that Aussie and copper tracking the GDP down, you know, they've even, they've even crashed further. And so we're expecting that whatever the government pronouncements are, that we are in that range of 4 to 5%. They just don't want us. They just don't want to tell the world that. Uh, the, the China recession is still very much alive. Um, there are big changes happening in the Chinese economy that are that could go, you know, make it change overnight as opposed to a gradual decline, right? It's not like um, the 20 year decline of GM or anything. It's uh, as people use cheaper cars, it's more, it's more China going completely changing its the, the base of its economy from producer to a consumer. So, so that's, you know, these few things gave us real pause and said, 
we better update China in a, in a thorough way as opposed to the machine updating itself. So today we want to introduce Shanghai Composite as a lever. Uh, you know, we've, we've been making a move. We've had a lot more international interest anyway. And so the same way we have beta to every, of every security to the S&P, people want that, uh, especially for A shares in China, especially for ADRs. They just like the Shanghai Composite beta. So why not give it to them? And then, of course, we can find our own um, equities uh, beta to that as well for, for the domestic equities. Uh, and so because those, those market and economic cycles are out of step, that's another reason. Um, we, think, we think copper, because of the USD rise, uh, you know, that has led to a lot of things, especially oil, especially industrial metals, have suffered in a way that's not China-specific, whereas they were very much on the pulse of where China's at. We think now it's it's going to lose its value because because uh, the dollar if it if it rises more than everything that's priced in dollars, especially industrial metals, especially precious metals, they just they just lose value, and so we can't attribute it to China. Uh, the all the other reason is that the U.S. rally, you know, maybe maybe the thinking last year as uh, was that the U.S. was more vulnerable to China than it is, or the U.S. was more vulnerable to uh, to Europe, and we saw that in 2012. We saw that before in um, the uh, the 2008 uh, Shanghai surprise. You know, just when Bear Stearns was going under. Uh, so there were there were kind of a murky reasons, but we thought the U.S. would be more susceptible to to a China slowdown. That's that isn't the case, and so it's time to update. Absolutely, we have a question about. Um, the Chinese uh, currency, the RMB, and uh, will the upcoming change in status of the, the RMB, uh, would that provide, offer any opportunities? You know, and of, of course the, the question there is going to be, uh, A, what happens between now and then, and, and B, is, is it truly going to be, even if the RMB does take its place as one of the world's reserve currencies potentially, is it going to well, is it truly going to be that in that it's truly uh, free floated in terms of its trading? Uh, you know, the, the government, the Chinese government has taken some steps to uh, re relax the peg uh, against the dollar a little bit at times, but then it has promptly tightened the peg back up in times of distress and, and basically not allowed the renminbi to, um, to trade very freely. So it basically sits, you know, in that neighborhood of six to the dollar and it's been sitting at that level for years. Um, I personally think so, that if, as yeah. long as there's a peg between the United States dollar and then officially then you know the Chinese currency is subordinate to the dollar. So then it yeah, therefore exactly, exactly. can never be its own independent thing. Right. And so I think that yeah that's what to look out for is when when it really does leave that range which you know it's interesting there had been talk for a long time about potential trades uh, in terms of investing and getting long the renminbi because when uh, the uh, peg was finally removed, it should shoot up in value. But what's interesting is in the intervening years since folks talked about that trade, that China actually shifted from being an exporter to being a net importer. And so the balance of uh, accounts has changed as well as the, as the Chinese economy is starting to mature and you have more consumers there. And so... Um, yeah, you want to look, no you hit a great obvious, point, Praveen. Yeah. You hit a great point, which is uh, look for the producer economies. If you're looking for... Um, currency, strong currency outside the U.S. dollar, uh, to to put your money in or to diversify your cash holdings. Look for producer nations. So uh, you might have seen in the past few weeks uh, uh, to turn the Greece story on its head. There were definitely calls from smart people uh, that Germany should leave the euro, right? Germany should leave it because it would benefit them, right? For whatever subjugation of Southern Europe that they benefit from politically, they'd benefit much more economically from their own super strong currency. And who's done that? Their next door neighbor, um, uh, Switzerland, right? They've left the peg and you can see the skyrocketing there. You probably missed the, the big move, but in terms of needing an alternative to gold, needing an alternative to Bitcoin to keep your money safe, that's not a US dollar. Swiss francs are it. You know, that is a much better alternative currency to the, to the US dollar. So to me, right. as long as there's a peg, it ain't happening for it. You know, China as a leading currency. Right. We'll talk a bit more about what about some of the metrics on the um, the Shanghai markets in, in a moment as we look at as we look at some of the um, the scenario 
potential scenario outcomes. So we are going to talk about, uh, you know, we'll, we'll speak first about the positive case. Uh, we ran the different scenarios, and we, and we ran the double happiness scenario earlier and saw that uh, this the potential for a rise in the uh, Shanghai market and in, in, in Chinese equities to, to shoot back up 25 percent. Well, what's driving this? This would, this would be represented in terms of uh, successful government action, meaning that some of, these, some of these actions that have been undertaken, you know, they have actually resulted, at least temporarily, in stopping the slide on the markets there. But, uh, we have had a nice bounce for probably, what, a week? Yeah, for, I guess it's, we're, we're in the second week now. The so second week. Some, some, le some level of stability on, on Chinese markets, uh, unless I missed anything at the close there. The, um, so, so we do see that. Uh, we see um, the, the, the general thesis here, though, and so maybe this is, this is you know, how I would answer the question, like, you know, in terms of opportunity. If one is, is seeking or, or, or looking at China as being an opportunity, the general thesis here is that China is, from a, from a world investor's perspective, it's almost, it's almost a certainty that you're under-allocated to China relative to its size in the world economy. And so if that sort of starts to rebalance because the Chinese financial system becomes more open and becomes more integrated with the world, then you are going to see uh, Chinese shares take their place as, uh, as being, uh, you know, again, roughly 15% of global equity markets because they are 50% of the world economy. So if that happens, that's clearly a positive scenario, and that's one of the scenarios that um, they could play out to benefit. Right. If you just look at normal asset allocations, you know, uh, so 20% of the U.S. because 20% of the world economy, 10% to China as they take their place as uh, a continual contributor also to the global GDP. Now there, you know, the so then in context of that double happiness scenario, what do we make of this uh, of this hiccup? And so just you know to say that okay, A shares haven't been this available to the world ever, and it was just beta testing in the same way you have bugs in healthcare.gov, uh, a new thing. So you have health, you have um, hiccups in everything. You know, just this new market, new system, and as as it matures, uh, you have the growing pains of an adolescent. Right, absolutely. And Raj, do you want to talk to us about uh, the China crash, this, which is actually right. the middle scenario? And yeah, uh, this is our baseline scenario, and so uh, you know, I'd say it's more bad than neutral. Although the United States, as you can see, um, you can see there in, um, and actually that that number is incorrect. The negative eight, it's actually negative four. So 32 percent down uh, in Shanghai only only led to a four percent hit. To the U.S., which we bounced back from, uh, that'll be corrected um, in the deck. But uh, you know, really, the the idea that a crash happens, don't look at so badly. Uh, it would be more about the those the market ills in China taking its toll on China, keeping their own GDP intact as well as our our S and P here, right? So the there are some reasons that it would crash and not just kind of go up uh, after these after these uh, government interventions. Number one is because of fundamentals, right? The, the 2007 peak, after that we had the Shanghai surprise, just leading straight into the Bear Stearns debacle in um, spring of 2008. You had a 67 PE. We're above that now, you know? So just the same way we have our own valuation risk here in the United States, um, there's a valuation risk there. So the PE ratio currently for their market uh, when when the July 8th kind of crash started, it was at 69, and so get, getting that froth out of the system is part of this Shanghai crash. It'd be it'd be plenty good for them. Um, one you know one thing is there won't be so much foreign money to support it uh, again because of kind of you know may, maybe because of uh, of lack of trust from from gun shy buyers uh, all the way to just institutions not. Uh, not able to invest because of because of uh, government controls. So that foreign money, if if it if it doesn't come back either by choice or by design from from the um, Chinese government, uh, we can see that that would be involved in the crash. So they if they're they're already out of that market. Um, we the the what Praveen was mentioning earlier about the three contemporaneous bubbles, equity, real estate, and credit. You know, we're, this would assume that 
the real estate and credit bubbles don't pop, and so their you know margin calls would um, would would not take people out completely. Uh, you'd have to see some margin calls allowed though. So there's this interesting fine line because it, you know the way that a crash happens is margin calls get put back in place by the Chinese government, and once that happens, that kind of you know sell at all cost, and so a Shanghai crash emerges from those margin calls um, put in place in all those new bank accounts. Uh, also, uh, because China is now a consumer country as opposed to a producer, uh, you know these this market rise. Um, that has happened produce some sort of wealth effect. You see more Chinese on planes to the U.S. You see them shopping, taking pictures, the way the Japanese did in the 80s. Um, and so here you'd have the reverse of that: a negative wealth effect, uh, a, a lack of propensity to spend uh, because they don't don't feel as wealthy from their their own equity holdings. Okay, so that's how it would work out. And again, uh, that will be corrected on the chart there. But the U.S. S&P hasn't suffered, you know. It's one eighth of the the impact on the Shanghai crash. Um, let's move over to what an ugly scenario looks like. Uh, and so here, you know, the good image is a, a, a crashing um, uh, a Chinese uh, skydiver here. And so again, th there are some serious changes in the uh, economy in China. You know, very much a watershed moment where it becomes a net importer. So whatever your you know whatever our thoughts of is when we shop through Walmart or Target and seeing everything made in China, whatever I mean they are a net importer of stuff, and so don't look at them as a producer country. So just like our GDP, you know we're at seventy percent consumption. They're going to have to rely on their GDP growth coming from also uh, from consum consumption, and you know the the idea here is that seismic change along with along with their country moving toward a, an urban type sprawl as opposed to rural you know so they they may consume less even there living in smaller spaces etc having less stuff less need for a car um, and so so these big picture economic changes for China are very different than the past 30 years um, and of course you know if if there was a proper recession you you'd see some ousting uh, or some serious political shakeup or you know the World Bank or the United States government saying, "What the hell? You know you you can't lie like that if you're going to be a, if you're going to be there." Uh, the chart you see there uh, is interesting. That's Caterpillar World Retail Sales uh, over the past um, you know the year over year changes, and it goes as far back as uh, 2006. You know if you can see that there. And so it, it, there's three three major eras: the kind of Great Recession there on the left. And then the pick back up once uh, you know coming back into 2009, 2010, and and seeing that immense skyrocketing of of capital purchasing, capital build out. But the past 31 months, so you know more than two two years, uh, your your no, about two and a half years this in this recovery where our stock markets pushed up and the Shanghai market pushed up uh, 150 percent. You're seeing Caterpillar's own World sales down, and so there's charts behind this, of course, as you would guess. You know, Caterpillar does break down their sales by regions, and so Asia, you know, down 30% one year, down 30% another year, down 20% the next year, and so you're seeing Asia particularly impacted, uh, uh, impacting Caterpillar's retail sales. So for us, you know, is there for all the news and all the hype? On bullishness of markets or bearishness of markets, here's just one company which happens to be part of the Dow 30, you know, and their stock hasn't suffered that much. It hasn't gained nearly as much as some of the tech flyers, but you're definitely seeing um, their retail sales, their own balance sheet, tell a way different story than than we're hearing in the press, right? Than anything we're hearing from economists even, and that's just that no capital purchases, and really down. And so, so if there is a recession in China, you know, you can point to something like this as as really something that something that smelled early on. Right, another another external indicator. All right, well, let's look at the summary of the various uh, scenarios that we we talked about and that we showed uh, in the tool earlier as well. So to summarize, the the good scenario, double happiness, involves. C 
seeing the Shanghai index, which is now our new key lever for this scenario. That's by key lever we mean that's the that is the indicator that we use to measure how how far along the scenario has progressed as uh, as that lever moves up or down. So as the Shanghai composite gets closer to 5,000, and that means that we are in the good scenario. Uh, and if it falls, conversely, we're in the bad, one of the bad scenarios. Um, but but that scenario is driven by this idea that that China manages to uh, assert control over its markets, that those measures uh, do end up being reasonably successful and uh, restore investor confidence uh, enough that uh, foreign investors are interested in uh, in purchasing shares and bringing its uh, share it, the, its sort of uh, share of uh, the equity market in line with its GDP share. No Long day, Praveen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> the, um, then in the middle you have the, the crash, the bad scenario. 25% uh, in Shanghai, but uh, just to uh, reiterate the, the limited impact in the U.S., more like an 8% impact is what we're projecting in the U.S., and that's based in part on the, the slide we showed previously that showed uh, the economic impact in China, uh, it only flows across at about uh, one fourth. Uh, you know, the the beta of the U.S. economy to the Chinese economy is about 0.25, if you will. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that as a downturn gets worse, gets more pronounced, and many of you will remember from 2008 that that often causes correlations to rise between, uh, you know, whether it's economies or, or equities. And so we see in the ugly scenario that as Shanghai is falling 50%, that that would uh, most likely lead to a more significant correction uh, in U.S. markets and other world markets, so something more in the 20% range on the S&P, so more significant impact. And that, of course, is going to have a, a bigger impact on commodities producers and other, um, and other companies, perhaps like a Caterpillar, that are sensitive to, to world growth. And, and in particular to the China market. GM actually is mentioned as one of the automakers, for example, that, that has a lot of Chinese market share. So companies that, that, that Yeah, have they that milk share. it off China. They that that's what brought them back to life, frankly. You know, they're the best right. selling and, car in China is uh, GM. More than Ford and more than their domestic uh, brands, which I don't know. Um, I will take a moment here to remind you that these you know, numbers uh, are a huge delta, uh, maybe, you know, two or three standard deviations of what's going to, what would happen to the S&P. Again, the key lever here is the Shanghai Composite. And so, you know, because of there has been such volatility, both up and down, that means our ranges are also kind of a wider step, right? Now that the, the, the impact, again, on the S&P would be more muted. And so, you know, explaining this to your clients, prospects, or to your own colleagues in your investment committee, it's really about what is the best gauge in, uh, of uh, of measuring this, and it's the Shanghai Composite as opposed to the to the S and P. Right. And so, we had a question: playing it safe with with having some Asian exposure, what are the safest sectors to focus on? Well, I'd answer that in a, in a broader way, actually, in terms of um, in terms of different markets. And, and how they move, uh, Shanghai is the most volatile, and so that's ETFs like, if any of you are familiar with A-Share, ASHR, that's a, an example ETF that tracks the Shanghai market directly, and there are others as well. But you have, there's actually a, a number of ETFs and mutual funds with, with much longer histories that track or, or, or purchase shares in uh, the Hong, on the Hong Kong exchanges. Or even if you're getting into individual equities, there are US, there tend to be a, a fair number of US listed ADRs that uh, are um, Hong Kong listed companies, and so you, while you do see a relationship there, and see um, uh, that they have been following the overall China picture, not nearly as fast. So not a um, hundred plus percent to the upside, but not 50 percent to the downside either. And so that may be a way, you know, with more. Uh, with some risk mitigation. The Hong Kong Stock Exchange is, a, you know, the Hang Seng is a lot more like the New York Stock Exchange or, or the or the FTSE in London in that, in that it has a private. It's a privately run thing, and so you know it has a history of private controls in place, and and kind of it works much. Although it has the taint of the Chinese government on it now, you know, for for centuries it ran as a as an independent, like a Western 
um, stock exchange. So, so that's why the impact is more muted there. Right. Well, let's the, talk the about new the story is the Chinese A shares and their availability to the world. Right. Yeah. So, Raj, let's talk about the takeaways. It, it is 5:30, and so let's make oh. sure that if we, we leave you with a couple key concepts. Okay. Yeah. Just really quickly. Again. Copper and Aussie dollar, they're the good barometers. Don't use the GDP pronouncements from the government. Uh, the Chinese market and the economic cycles, they don't dance well together, just like Genesis, they can't dance. And uh, the, um, the, the capture of the downside for the US of anything that happens in China, as it becomes bigger moves to the downside, then of course the US, you know, with the, the whole saying goes, all correlations go to one, etc. And so we aren't saying that, but the capture uh, of of the downside, where it's maybe a quarter uh, of what's happening there, would happen to us uh, in, the, in the United States. That increases as the magnitude increases of the the downturn. And the the main thing, if there's one thing that you must know about why the volatility happened, why there was a huge rise in Shanghai in the fall, it's because of margin lending, straight up. You know that credit bubble. Is uh, it's, it's it's a new thing to them, margin lending. The same way it was new to the U.S. investor in the 1920s. Uh, 